So in the second volume of Harry Potter, correct me if I have any of these details wrong, you remember there's that snake, the basilisk? So there's this magic castle, right? You guys have no problem with that. Magic castle, no problem. There's an orphan, he's an orphan, he goes to the magic castle to learn how to be more than normal, right? The muggles, he has a muggle family. We're not too happy with the muggle family. Like as representatives of normal people, they, they have some lacks. Now of course the reason for that is that well, that's what teenagers often feel about their parents, right? They feel, Jesus, these couldn't really be my parents. I must have some other parents who are, like, together. And those are like magical parents, right? Parents that live in the sky. And, of course, Harry Potter has earthly parents. That's the Muggles. And Dur Dursley, I think, is the kid. He's a, one he's a wonderful piece of work. <laughs> and, uh, you know, ill-formed, eh? Spoiled, ill-formed, selfish. Very far from the ideal. He's a foil for Harry. And of course, he's appreciated and doted on, and Harry is actually punished for his virtues. Well, that's a classic story, right? To, to be punished for your virtues. I mean, if you look at the story, the central story in Christianity, the central story in Christianity is about someone who is precisely punished in the worst possible way for the highest possible virtues. And that's what it makes it an archetypal story, because there isn't anything more unfair than that. And so it's a limit, in a sense. You, it can't be worse than that. Being punished for being, you know, unworthy, it's like, yeah, yeah, well, at least makes sense. But to be punished because you have your act together and you're a good person, that's real punishment. And that's what happens to Harry. So, luckily he finds out that he's magical, which is quite convenient. And off he goes to wizarding school. And, you know, that's actually like taking, that's actually like going and studying the humanities. I mean, it was when they still were, you know, because you, it's through the humanities that you, that you make contact with the magic of your culture. And that makes you more than merely the child of your parents. Because you are more than merely the child of your parents, you're the child of nature, and you're the child of culture. And until you understand what that means, understand that you have two sets of parents, like the divine hero always has two sets of parents, you, you can't construe yourself properly as an individual. You're not situated properly in the world. You don't know what your responsibilities are. You can't orient your values properly. And you will suffer for that. Because, as far as I can tell, because life is so difficult, you have to do something that's truly worthwhile in order to justify it. And so, well, and that's what all these stories tell you. That's what the story of Jonah is telling you. It's like, you have an ethical duty to straighten things up. And if you don't do it, you're going to be sorry. And that story is echoed everywhere. Well, now St. George, well, let's go to Harry Potter. That's what we were talking about. So he goes off to the magic castle, and uh, he's learning to be a wizard. And he's kind of an interesting character, right? Eh? Because he's not really good. And we find out, I think, that's because, doesn't he have a piece of Voldemort in him? Isn't that what happens? Yeah. And that's what that means is that to be good, truly good, you can't just follow rules. That's, that's very clear in, in the Harry Potter story. And you also have to be able to understand malevolence. And in order to understand malevolence so that you can withstand it, you have to understand that part of you that's malevolent. Because if you don't, you're naive. And if you're naive, you're easy pickings. And so, that's a Jungian idea too. And the Jungian idea is that part of personality development is to understand your shadow. And the shadow is those things about you that you do not want to admit to. And you can learn about your shadow by reading history. You know, you can read about Auschwitz. You can read about the concentration camps in Russia. And you can imagine yourself as a guard. Instead of as a heroic rescuer of unfortunate victims, which would be very, very unlikely. And once you can imagine yourself as a guard, which is a terrifying thing to do, then you understand something about yourself. And I actually think, and I think this is also from stud studying Jung, that you cannot have proper respect for yourself until you know that you're a monster. 
because you won't act carefully enough. You know, if you think, well, I'm a nice person, I'd never do anyone any harm. It's like, you're no saint. You can be sure of that. And the harm that you do people can come in many, many ways. And so, if you regard yourself as harmless, inoffensive, nice, well, why do you have any reason to be careful? You're like a teddy bear sitting on a shelf. Even if you throw it at someone, no one's going to get hurt. But that isn't what you're like, because you're a human being, and human beings are some vicious creatures. And there's utility in knowing that, because it's also the case, you know, in the Harry Potter series, Harry could stand up against Voldemort and understand him and speak his language, because he was infected by him to some degree. Very, very interesting idea. Anyways, in the second, and the reason I'm telling you this, and this is worth thinking about, it's like, how long were each of those books? Like 500 pages? They were long, eh? And there was, how many of them? Seven? And how many of them were sold? I mean, how many of you read every Harry Potter book? Right? That's a, how many of you read at least one? Okay, how many of you saw the movies? It's like, you're all in a cult. <laughs> <laughs> you are, I'm telling you, really, that's the truth. It's really the truth. So, in the second volume, there's this snake that's zipping around there, the basilisk, right? And it lives in the underground. That's chaos. That's chaos. And that's because wherever you are, you're on thin ice, and underneath your thin ice is chaos. And here we are, in this unbelievably civilized environment, and everyone's getting along so perfectly. But, you know, we've got, hot, we've got lights, we've got electricity, the sewage system is working, no one's hungry, it's like, we can be peaceful. But if any of that fell apart, and it could easily fall apart, because it's a bloody miracle it ever works at all, then the chaos that's just underneath the surface is going to come up right now. And it's useful to know that, because it makes you properly grateful, if you really understand it, it makes you properly grateful for the bloody miracle that it is that you can be here in peace. So anyways, there's this snake that's underneath the surface, and it's, you know, no joke, that thing. It's big, and it's ancient. It's always been there. And what happens if you look at it? It turns you to stone, right? It paralyzes you. Well, that's the, Mor that's the Gorgon, that's Medusa, the woman with the head of snakes. And if you look at her, it paralyzes you. Well, what does that mean? Well, you're walking through the jungle, and a big snake appears. What do you do? You freeze, and no bloody wonder, because you're a prey animal, and that's what they do when they see things that are going to eat them. And so, the snake, well, lots of people still die from snake bite. And our ancestors were, and I mean our ancestors like, you know, tens of millions of years ago, when they were living in trees and weren't very big, they made a nice snack for a snake. And there's a woman named Lynn Isbell, who's an anthropologist at UCLA, who's correlated the presence of carnivorous snakes with the acuity of primate vision. And what she found was that the more snakes around, the better the primates could see. So, and we're particularly good at picking up patterns like snake camouflage in the lower half of our visual quadrant. You know, and people generally don't like snakes, you can learn to handle them, but no, snake fear appears to be innate. It's innate in chimpanzees, and it tends to increase as you age rather than decreasing. You can overcome it, but... Well, my daughter had snakes, and one day her snake bit her. It was a fairly big snake. And she hadn't pay, paid attention to it for a while, so it nailed her. And from then on, she ha had a very difficult time grabbing the snake. It was like, bitten once, you know, shy, permanently. She also told me, years later, she had nightmares about snakes all the time when she had a snake in her room. It's like, you know, and I think it was probably the smell. So, anyways. So, Harry Potter decides he's going to go after the basilisk, right? He's going to go out there and face the thing that he's most afraid of. So he does that. Way down in the depths. So it's like Jonah going down into the depths. And he faces the basilisk. And it bites him. And you know, that's, a, that's right, because if you go down into the depths, you can get bitten. Like, it's no joke. And th this is a hero story, but 
the thing about the hero story is it's actually real, the thing that you're facing is actually dangerous and even though facing it voluntarily might be your best bet and is likely your best bet, because that's the central story of humanity that doesn't mean you're going to succeed it's the real thing, so anyways he gets bitten right? and he's gonna die now he's rescuing Ginny so that's the St. George story, if you go after a dragon dragons like to capture virgins God only knows why I think it's because I think it's because one of the things that male humans have done from the beginning of time is chase the damn predators away and I suspect that the males from God only knows how long ago who were particularly good at that were rewarded with female attention and why the hell not so it's deeply rooted inside of us that idea of facing the unknown and freeing the woman so the idea there is that if you it's a male idea in, in large part I can talk about the central female myth and I will as we proceed the idea is that if you're the sort of person who can stand up against the unknown and the frightening then you're also likely, if you develop into that sort of person then you're also likely to develop into the sort of person that other people will find attractive so you know, and that's why Jung believed that the inside the shadow was the anima which is like a female figure and so his idea was something like you know, if you look, watch movies there's always this beta male guy if they're romantic movies and he's a nice guy and he's the friend and you know, the woman tells him everything but she doesn't like him a bit she likes the guy who's like got an edge and, and who's capable of, I would say, mayhem but at least of aggression now that doesn't mean she wants him to be aggressive but what it does mean is that she wants him to be able to be aggressive that would be good and so he's the romantic target and so he's the person that's incorporated the shadow and he's someone that is respectable and perhaps useful and so, well that's a very old story So let's, let's think about this for a minute I've already offered you a proposition and I think it's an important proposition and I'm, I'm offering you this proposition so that you can make sense of art and literature and mythology and religion and dance and all those strange ritualistic things that human beings do which seem central to us including, including, not least the ineradicable tendency of us to seek out stories of heroes I should finish the, the Harry Potter story so Harry Potter goes down there to rescue Virginia no, it's, uh, that's not her name what is it? Ginny, Ginny yeah but there's a, there's a formal name for that it's a variant of Virginia anyways which is a variant of Virgin so, um, and he gets bitten Gen yes, Ginevra, that's it he gets bitten and the bite is poison and so there he is dying which doesn't seem to be so good and then what happens and again you guys swallow this it's no problem so what's his name the Dumbledore character he's got a bird right so he's the wise old man he's the ruler of the castle he's the ruler of the magic castle he's the magic king you know he's like God the father as far as Harry Potter is concerned and he has a bird what kind of bird is it? it's a phoenix, right? and one of the things that's very strange about a phoenix is that well, it's immortal, but in a strange way you know, it lives and lives, I think, a hundred years and it gets older and older, and then one day, poof, it bursts into flames and turns into an egg, and then you get a new phoenix so that's a symbol of transformation it's a symbol of transformation the bird is a spirit, or psyche and so, here's what it means in part, you know <laughs> you know how when you learn a lesson in your life that that's not very pleasant? right, it's not like when you learn something important <laughs> it's the best day of your life it's often the importance of what you learn is often proportionate to just how wretched it is to learn it you know, you learn things the hard way 
You learn things by getting hit. Because, obviously, if what you're doing is working, you get what you want. There's no learning in that, and that's happy. It's when you're doing something and you hit an obstacle, and maybe you bloody well hit it hard, and then you know you recoil, and then you down into the depths you go, and you have to sort yourself out, and you realize that you're you know this particular kind of idiot, and that you should probably fix that, and that's really annoying and difficult, and you know, and maybe you're down in the dumps and anxious for quite a while, and then you get it repaired more or less, and you know you put yourself back together. That's the phoenix. Poof, into flames, bang, egg, new you. And so, you know, that's the ability to learn. Now, human beings are very strange creatures, right? Because we're very malleable compared to most animals. You know, like grizzly bears now and grizzly bears a thousand years ago. It's like, whatever. They're the same thing. They do the same thing. There's no transformation. But human beings, we have this massive brain. And, you know, it's a pain because it means you have to take care of human children until they're 40 and, <laughs> and that's a big burden And so, you know, we pay a big price for it, it also makes childbirth very difficult And, uh, and it's costly, you have to eat a lot because you have a big brain because it uses up a lot of energy And so, you know, you, you pay a price for it, but the advantage is you're plastic You can learn Now, learning is a strange thing because you could think of it as just acquiring more information But you could also think of it, and this is more accurate, as Finding out something that you're doing wrong So that's sort of built into you, like a character A char element of your character, a presumption of your perception, or a deep habit It's really built into you It's a neural structure, right? It's, it's alive And you have to kill it Because it isn't working properly and the pain that you go through, in part, when you're suffering because you did something stupid, is It's something like your, your, the neurology I can never get this quite right It's the pain of the death of that structure And that can be a huge chunk of you, you know, if, if you really have to go through a massive revision It's like, the person that comes out the other end might hardly be the same at all you know, that happens, for example, if you're trying to combat alcoholism Which is just, you know, a wretched thing to do because Well, all your friends are alcoholic <clears throat> All your family drinks too much The only thing you know how to do when you're socializing is to go to the bar and drink too much You know, and you spend like 20 hours a week on it It's like, it's not just that you're addicted to the substance It's like, that's how you live And so if you want to stop being an alcoholic not only do you have to stop drinking alcohol, but you have to stop seeing all your drunk friends And maybe you've had them for your whole life And you have to have continual battles with your drunk family And then you have to figure out something to do with that 20 hours that's now like Hanging around your neck like an albatross And so, you have to let that whole part of your personality die And a new part has to spring forth And that's what the phoenix is and the phoenix is the capacity of the person to transform And so, when Harry gets bit by the snake that freezes him He gets seriously injured, the phoenix comes in, cries some tears in his wound It repairs him, bang, he's back to life And the th strange thing is, that that's okay with all of the viewers Now why would that be? There's nothing about it that's rational Nothing Right? Magic castle? That's not rational Giant snake underneath it? That's a little more rational <laughs> Turning you to stone, going down there to face it, being rejuvenated by a phoenix? It's like, yeah, yeah, that's okay, we can We'll watch that, we'll, we'll swallow it, we'll be completely engaged in it And the reason for that is because it's a myth It's about how people it's a meta-story about how to act, about how to conduct yourself in the world To face the things that you're afraid of, that would otherwise paralyze you To let the death of what is insufficient about you occur And then to wait for the rebirth 